Right, I'm very happy to be here today. Thanks for joining me today to hear about this topic I've uh, talked about for a few times. Uh, I'll try and make this interesting as well. Uh, later on at the end, there'll be a little bit of a demo, so I would need all of your help later on to participate in it, uh, to be a little bit uh, part of a history of uh, internet later on. Okay, so as very kindly uh, introduced just now, my name is Boyun. I'm a Senior Engineering Manager in Ascenda. Uh, but over the years, I've worked with a number of different companies as well, uh, more recently in Grab, as well as in Rakuten Viki. Uh, through these different companies, I've uh, amassed uh, some knowledge here and there, as well as grown to appreciate certain parts of technologies like the cloud. So over the years, uh, similar to what you'll see in NUS Hackers over here, right? I've been participating in external activities like the GDG uh, community in Singapore. So some of you might have seen me there before. Uh, so that's why I also have this title as the uh, Google Developer Expert, which I go around the region to help uh, speak on Google Cloud related matters. Lah. There's also the AWS Community Builder. It's a bit more of a smaller role, but they, they give me free credits to build stuff. So no, I'm happy about that as well. I'll talk more about that later if folks are interested. Lah. I mean, anyone can be a community builder if you want to go apply for it, get 500 bucks, few credits a year, you can go for that. Okay, but I want to first start off my entire discussion here with a survey first. Anyone knows how to do this? You got your own hardware server somewhere, you know how to do this. Yeah, I see someone mouth and say no money. <laughs> okay, let me change the question up a little bit. Cloud. Hey, what the heck? Okay, this was, this was not the response I was looking for. Really, like, like serverless, for example, like for cloud functions, uh, whether it's in AWS, uh, Lambda AWS, uh, or uh, Google Cloud uh, Cloud functions. Anyone? Oh, no. Okay, I'm, oh, I see one. Okay, I see one hand raised. Thank you for briefly raising up and supporting me. Um, so that was not the answer I was expecting. I was expecting more of it. Uh, but why I wanted to survey this? Essentially because, uh, if you look at the stats we see in recent years, uh, it's a little bit small on the screen, but I'll just explain. This is a report I got from IFDA. Uh, the top right hand side over here is showing the stats for cloud computing uh, that uh, SMEs and non-SMEs have adopted over the years. So 2018 is this orange color thing, and the purple one is 2022. And you can see over the years, there's more and more adoption of cloud related technologies. And if you look at global trends, more and more companies are also moving towards the cloud. So okay, not just talking about like AI in the scape of like, you know, our landscape today, but also even just knowing about how to harness this cloud technologies, right? You can put yourself, you know, as a student or as a employee, you know, in our environment today, right? A lick up in terms of finding internships and work today. Okay, so I'd like to share a little bit about life before the cloud. Uh, for you guys, I think this will be considered like maybe 10, 20 years ago. Uh, so some of these images, maybe you'll be familiar with it, maybe not. Let's see. Anyone seen something like this before? Oh, you've seen something. Where do you seen it before? In school. Oh, they, they still have hardware. Okay, yeah. yeah. Somewhere in Com 1. I know there is. Hmm. So just to mention, Com 1 also got that. So got this place somewhere. If you all know something, I think it's basement if I'm not wrong. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But when you have situations like this, right? You will also have situations like this. <laughs> you got hardware servers, right? Then you have to maintain it yourself. You hope it doesn't go down, especially like in the wake of a public holiday. Because you like if not, you have to go in and go and fix stuff. And then there's also stuff like this. You don't recognize where's this place? So it has happened before, uh, many, many years ago. Uh, actually I got this picture because I couldn't find a picture for uh, com. But there was a period when I was still a student here where the, the server room actually got flooded after a torrental rainfall. So if you have your own hardware servers, right? I mean, you have to be prepared for failures like this. Okay, essentially mechanical related failures or act of uh, God or act of nature, lah, essentially. And there's a lot more factors that you have to take in, you know, in terms of whether you're using your own uh, server racks, right? Or going into the cloud. For things like maintenance costs, scalability, security, you know, uh, when I'm talking about stuff like costs, right, I'm talking about things like economies of scale that the cloud providers can provide for. Because if you think about it, they are providing for all of the users that comes to use their data centers services. But if you do it yourself, right, you have to go and hire your own experts to go and run your own small mini data center. And in case you all don't know, right, running a business, most of your costs will come from manpower. 
So using a cloud effect is going to be a really a very big savings right to your expenditure, especially if you think about running a startup. Security, right? When I say security here, I'm not just talking about you know what you guys are familiar about security on your uh, software. I'm also talking about the actual servers, like you know, arm guards protecting your data centers. Because if you think about it, if someone has access to your server racks, right? I mean, that essentially is another form of vulnerability. So again, if you have your own servers, right, you wouldn't be getting your own arm guards yourself. So you had a question. Ah. Wait, did someone just went to the, the the hardware and immediately just did something there or what? Uh huh. Ah, uh, I think that that probably is more online related, like social engineering or stuff like that, lah. Not not the hardware, lah. But the hardware, what I'm talking about is when you have people actually attacking your actual data centers. I mean. Likelihood is low, but it can happen. I mean, if you leave a server rack out there, anyone can just go and uh, plug in a thumb drive and get whatever data is on the server rack. Huh? I mean, you can also do that. I'm just saying that physical security is also a problem if you have your own data center. That's why you should, uh, if you use the cloud, that's one less thing you have to worry about. Yeah. Okay, there's also other benefits of using a cloud since for most folks, you have not uh, so much of using the cloud today, right? One thing that I'll definitely want to sort of sell to y'all, okay, but I want to be very clear, I'm not selling for Google Cloud, I don't work for them. I'm only a Google developer expert, they don't pay me for doing this. Uh, but the point I'm trying to drive here is, we're not just looking at hosting our applications in virtual machines in the cloud today. We're talking about a bunch of other services that they are providing for, right? Uh, like, for example, for AI, I think a lot of you might have heard about Gemini. So you're using their services, right, rather than building all of these things from scratch. And by using them as a platform, right, you can leverage away like a lot of this work that you would have done yourself if you were to, let's say, start your own teams in building these services. So I think that's really a very big benefit, right, if you're looking at going into using cloud uh, in this 21st century, especially in this last 10 years. Okay, so I'm going to talk about two case studies. One of them is about the topic that you have seen that I guess that's why you are here today listening, um, which is about live streaming using Google Cloud. Okay, problem statement. Uh, we know when you're doing any internship or working for any company, usually when you do a project, they'll ask you what's your problem statement. Why are you doing this project? Okay, so anyone of you remember this period? Uh, actually, I want to remind you all right, of a very momentous timeline right, of what happened recently. Like, uh, now we're April 5th, right? If you all recall, four years ago, April 7th, right, that was our first circuit breaker in Singapore. So that was when everything went down, I think even for the events like, uh, like this, right? You couldn't do it in the physical space anymore like today. So we had to look at uh, hosting some of our events online. And because I was helping uh, volunteer for some of these communities, you know, we had to figure out a solution as well. Okay, so we know if we want to continue our activities, we need some sort of live streaming solution, push all of our uh, attraction online and get people to view our content from there. Okay. But for our live streaming solution, our problem statement here is that we have a multitude of different conditions that we want to solve for. Firstly, we're doing it for free, so it must be affordable because no one, well, no one wants to pay for any of our very expensive solution. Another thing is that it must be easy to use. If this entire setup is online, right, I need to get my guest speaker to also plug in into the system. If I need to get them to do like a one hour setup of installing a bunch of things, it's defeating the purpose. Like. I mean, this will scare off like some potential speakers as well. Uh, and we had one special condition over here is to be able to stream to multiple destinations because we were also working with a bunch of communities at that point. So we were thinking about can we stream to let's say three YouTube channels and two Facebook pages and maybe, maybe to LinkedIn as well. Uh, and this was our challenge to find a solution that solved for all of these needs. Okay, speaking as an engineer, but as a sane engineer first, uh, the important part is don't reinvent the wheel. You know, if there is a solution out there that does what you need, you should use it first. So we did try to look for a bunch of solutions, paid solutions uh, or free solutions, like for example, using Facebook to stream or using OBS, which actually I just heard you guys are using here as well. And then using paid solutions like StreamYard, uh, a bunch of this that we couldn't really find uh, that solve for what we need because they were either, let's say like not free, uh, not entirely 
free if you go for the highest tier in StreamYard. Or in terms of OBS, it's not that easy to set up because now you need to get your guest speakers to also maybe install like some variant of this application on their uh, device as well. Now, so all of this didn't really solve our, so, uh, our problem over here. So we decided, okay, maybe we need to build a little bit of something, uh, but better sense prevail, you know, what if we just turn the current solution, like just improve the current solution and just see if we can get it to do what we need. So we decided to go with a paid solution, StreamYard, but we go with the lowest tier and use part of its service, right, to help us do the entire relay using Google Cloud. So this is how it works. StreamYard, right, if you pay for the lowest tier, what they allow you is you can do streaming, let's say, via your current device and be able to stream to some destinations. But in theory, right, one configuration they allow us is to allow us to send that RTMP stream, right? RTMP itself referring to our live stream over here over to any machine that we have, be it in Google Cloud or in AWS. And in theory, right, you can just create an application to help you just do that multiplexing to multiple destinations, as many as we want, as long as we can provide the computing power to be able to do this. Okay, and this solves for all of our needs because if you think about it, right, well, I'm paying for a subscription in StreamYard, but for Google Cloud or any cloud provider, I can just bring up the application at the point of time of my uh, events, right, and bring it down after that saving a lot of money in the process. Okay, and later on, when I refer to our build application, right, in the end, I think we spent around maybe just 70 cents per event, two hour, three hour event that we did, uh, which was really affordable. Okay, talk is cheap, but let's look at how we actually did it. So I want to use a infrastructure diagram to show you how we get, got the entire solution out. We're going to start with a black box first. Uh, essentially, we know something needs to be built in Google Cloud. Now, if you're hosting an application, right, using any cloud provider, usually the first thing you need to ask yourself is what type of hosting solution that you should go for. And usually there's two to three different solutions you can ask yourself uh, which one should you use, either serverless or infrastructure as a service. There's one more, which is cluster orchestration, which some of you might hear by the name called Kubernetes, uh, but that's going a little bit too far. Uh, in the case of serverless, it's good to use it if you just want something that's easy to start with. Uh, especially in the, in the case of like, you know, um, a team of one to two people. So maybe serverless would be a better choice. But if you're using infrastructure as a service, right, what you want is that virtual machine box and being able to customize directly on that uh, virtual machine itself. You can customize, but now you need to do a lot of the heavy lifting yourself by maintaining that uh, virtual machine yourself. Okay, in our case, right, surprisingly, we went for infrastructure as a service. Uh, because of a customization, one single customization that we need from a virtual machine box that we couldn't get from serverless, which is essentially exposing port 1935, which is needed for the RTMP streams. So, Bopian, no choice. We have to go for a virtual machine instance rather than serverless. Okay? Okay, so you're going to see, I, I'm going to keep adding on like more and more tools like, that I use over here just to show you, you know, how you can build an application in the cloud. Okay, so the first thing we're starting with is a compute engine in Google Cloud. The equivalent will be EC2 uh, inside AWS. Okay, and over here you can see that uh, I'm not going to dive into the application code, but essentially I'm using this Nginx server with an RTMP module. And using this RTMP module, this is a free solution. You can basically just put, put a bunch of like push URLs, which signify the uh, YouTube URL as well as the Facebook URL. Uh, later again, I'll show how this works in a demo. Blah, 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 there's other stuff I'll explain later. Okay, now that we have our uh, application, like where to host it using the virtual machine in, uh, in Compute Engine, uh, what else do we need over here? Okay, this is not yet completed. You know, what about network settings? Uh, am I going to just expose all of my uh, ports to the internet? So I should use something like Cloud Network Services in Google Cloud to just secure all of the ports but only expose port 1935. Uh, part of the my application code would make sure that there is a secret key that's required if you were to send your stream to my server. Okay, so I'll ignore all other streams that doesn't have this secret key. Okay, then with network settings set up, but it's still a very ugly way of setting up your service, right? Imagine, you know, if you are deploying this application for every single live stream, uh, every event, right? I need to go into this virtual machine, shell it inside, install this, install that, git clone application. Uh, very, very leche, very, very troublesome. Anyone knows what you can do over here to simplify the process of an application? Any brief soul? Oh, yes, containerization. You can go with containerization. 
Uh, so the, the interesting thing is, if you're looking at the cloud services, right, usually, whether it's for Google Cloud or AWS, uh, the containerization approach usually applies more for the server service. Uh, in this case, using Compute Engine Infrastructure as a Service, you can actually apply containerization as well using this specialized uh, tool called the Container Optimized OS, or it's a configuration in Compute Engine. And by doing that, I can just load the Docker image into this uh, virtual machine itself, entire application goes up. Uh, I just need to build it once for the first time, and that's it. Repeated updates of this application can just be immediately pushed to this virtual machine. Okay, but that, that's not the end. Some of the more observant folks in the audience here right, might be asking, okay, you know, I have this Docker file. I create this image. I'm going to push it to this virtual machine. But where does the virtual machine know where to get this image from? Uh, you can host it in, let's say, a free solution like Docker Hub. Uh, but for folks who have not used Docker Hub before, right, like you can use it to host your Docker image. Uh, but the thing is, if you push to there for free, right, or rather you use the free subscription, it, your image will be public. Okay, so what it means is that if this is a secret project, right, you're essentially exposing your Docker image, your application code to the whole world. Uh, so you don't want to do that, you can actually use another tool in Google Cloud to help you save the image as well. Okay, so we're going to use this thing called Container Registry. Uh, essentially, you can just think of it as a repository to allow you to save your Docker images. Okay, at this point of time, I like to say that when I took this screenshot recently, I saw that, oh yeah, it's being deprecated. Huh? So uh, my advice over here is, yes, I'm giving, like, I'm sort of giving a talk over here to show what cloud services you can use. Uh, but if you're thinking about hosting a Docker images, please use Artifact Registry uh, instead. Uh, later on in my second case study, I'll talk about this, uh, expand on it more. Okay, now that we have our, we have made this setup less manual, we've added in containerization. Is this application completed at this point? Not yet, because there's more that I want to do. Even building this entire Docker image can be a little bit troublesome if I were to do it manually. You know, every single time I need to uh, type the commands, Docker build, blah, 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 Docker push, and then push it to the my uh, what's that, image repository. So what if I automate the process? Every time someone merge some code to my master branch in GitHub, it should just trigger like some sort of CICD pipeline, and then just push this image directly to my code repository, uh, my image repository. Okay, so you can, of course, you can use something like GitHub Actions, you can use GitLab CI. Uh, for me, of course, I want to use everything in one single ecosystem. Uh, and also because if I'm being charged for it, I might as well be charged in one single uh, platform. Lah. So I'm using Cloud Build as part of the Google Cloud to be able to do this entire CICD pipeline. Uh, this one is a, just a very simple configuration where I run two stages in series, installing node modules, and then after that, pushing the Docker image to my image repository. Okay. So with a simple configuration, like just 20 lines, right, you can already have a uh, fully equipped CICD pipeline that can trigger every single time someone merge some code to your master branch in GitHub. Okay, now that we have our CICD pipeline put in, is this completed at this point? Not yet. Now, if I'm dealing with a application over here, a production application over here, right, uh, what other needs would you see like this, this require? Like remember just now I mentioned I want to gatekeep and make sure that random people cannot just send like random weird live streams like you know people being naked and then that will stream over my own public channels. Um, so I have to secure it using some key, right? But the thing is, I can't just put a key inside the virtual machine. I need to securely put that key inside somehow. And I shouldn't put it inside the Docker image. Because if you expose it in a Docker image, if let's say someone else managed to obtain that Docker image, they also will get your credentials. So one way of going around this is you can use another tool called Secret Manager. Uh, over here, essentially, you have a production-grade uh, secure platform right, in Google Cloud in allowing you to store the secrets. And then at the, when I'm deploying my application, all I need to do is pull the secrets uh, at deployment time and use the secrets uh, as this application is being deployed. Okay, uh, And you can also see there's other secrets I put in here. Uh, later on, I'll, okay, I won't mention about it, but you can just put a bunch of secrets if you want in here to use for different needs. Okay, after putting in Secrets Manager, is that sufficient? Well, the thing is, if this virtual machine right, can get the secret from Secret Manager, it means that you and I can just go to our, like, our terminal and just try and like, call like, some curl command and just get the secret, right? Like, how do we actually know that this virtual machine can talk to the Secret Manager? Okay, there's another thing in the cloud that you can use to secure this access, which is to use this thing called Identity and Access Management. 
so the tool of identity access management, or IAM, is the same thing in uh, Google Cloud and AWS. By using IAM, you can actually have a very easy way of just like you know clicking a drop down and just assigning some sort of role or privileges uh, to a certain identity uh, inside your cloud environment. And usually you will assign it to two different types of characters over here. You can either assign it to a user account, that means it's like you know you and I, actual humans, or you can assign it to a service account. And a service account is essentially think of it as a machine account, right? That you as assign this machine identity to you know whatever machine process or workflow that you have and you give them this authorization to be able to do certain things. So over here, you can see that I'm giving my machine the role of being able to access Secret Manager, okay? So it means that only this machine can access Secret Manager and myself as an admin, I can do that as well. No one else should be able to access my secrets. Okay, so with that, we have uh, our Secret Manager in. Theoretically speaking, at this point, right, this application is done already, right? As long as I start the stream over here, it goes to Nginx, I can deploy this entire thing and I can just relay it to all of my uh, the other uh, public channels over there. Okay, But I'm very kiasu, you know, uh, or kiasi in a way as well. I want to add more things over here because I'm an engineer and it's fun to put more things in here. And one very legit concern is uh, what if systems goes down? What if YouTube goes down? Actually, just curious question. Anyone seen YouTube go down before? Oh, no. Do you remember when? Yeah. So, uh, partially went down. Okay, the, there's one time it actually fully went down, uh, along with Google Cloud, along with a bunch of Google based services. Lah. And so, most of you may not have heard of this before. Uh, okay, it happened twice in maybe the last 10 years. Uh, why I remember it? Because I think one of it was my wedding anniversary. And I was in a staycation somewhere and I got woken up by some alarms lah, uh, at maybe 2 a.m. in the middle of the night. Uh, so it was memorable because I was in a hotel trying to debug, uh, trying to bring up our cloud services since we're using Google Cloud. Uh, not a good story to mention about using Google Cloud, but things like this happen well, it's twice in 10 years. Lah, so I mean, better than you maintaining your own hardware services yourself. Okay, but like I said, it's uh, being a bit kiasi here, uh, afraid to lose, right? You know, what if this services goes down? What if you know, let's say YouTube goes down, I'm streaming to YouTube. How can I get like some MP4 file, right? Later on, I can keep it myself to re-upload to YouTube. Okay. Uh, remember the node server I mentioned about? So using my Nginx service, right? I'm able to create this MP4 file. And using my node server, I just do this very simple job of picking up the MP4 file and then saving it in this thing called cloud storage. Again, the cloud storage is a GCP, is a Google Cloud related tool. In AWS, if you use it before, it's called S3. Okay, so you can use it to store it in this uh, object storage um, somewhere in your cloud systems, and you can access these files later on, be it like part of an application, or if you just need to use it to store, let's say, like logs, for example. In this case, I'm just storing this uh, MP4 file so I can use it for other purposes later on. Okay, with this. All right, with this additional Kiasi move, right, I already have like this production grade application, some uh, robustness in place. Is this enough? Going by the same trend of what I've been saying, no, it's not enough. Uh, just now I talked about like set, setting up this virtual machine manually, right? But now if you look at it, right, now I need to set up the CSV pipeline manually as well, this image registry manually. Then I need to create this uh, cloud storage bucket and then you create the sequence manager and all that. Uh, so, is there a way where I can just click one button and set up this entire thing at once and then click another button and it brings down everything? Anyone knows what's the answer? Is there a, such a thing today that can do this? Terraform. Terraform is correct, but Terraform is an application of it. Uh, what's, what, what is Terraform? Like, what's the concept behind it? Yes, correct. Infrastructure as code. Okay, yeah. Okay, so it's written something at the top. Infrastructure as code. Uh, you are correct. Terraform actually would be the solution I recommend today. Although for the sake of the argument of using the cloud, I'm using Deployment Manager instead. Um, the difference itself shouldn't be too big. I mean, in terms of Terraform is just more of that central provider, right? That uh, where people can contribute their own modules that links into the resources you can create in a cloud environment. So if you're familiar with how to use Terraform, right? You can use it across, let's like, say, AWS, Azure, GCP. Uh, but in my case, yeah, again, like I said, I'm just demonstrating what you can build if you want to use Google Cloud for everything. So you can use Deployment Manager, uh, just create like uh, additional shell script as well to bring it up. Uh, and then all of the resources can be brought up by just running this once in a script. 
Okay, and basically this is just how it looks like in Google Cloud. Lah. But I'm not gonna dwell on this too much. Okay, and with that, everything is complete. Okay, this is that's it, that's it. No more no more Kiasi Gasunas in here already. Okay, and with this entire application setup, we were able to stream using just the, the lower subscription and stream yeah, stream to five different uh, channels at once. Like three YouTube, this one, this one, this one, and then two Facebook pages. Uh, all at once for one single event. Uh, like I said, the cost was only around like I think 70 cents USD per two hour live stream. Okay, so what, we, what have we learned today? Uh, you can have a very complex solution in Google Cloud, uh, but just made easy by just using a lot of the tools they have over here. Uh, and this was a production grade application built really fast as well within a time period of let's say one to two months. I'll demo it at the end. Okay, so, oh, go so for it. Three, YouTube, is it three different channels? Three different channels, yes. Why, why, why do you want to do that? Uh, that is a very good question. Back at the time where we were doing this entire live streaming process, we wanted to reach out to as many communities as possible. So one of it was in Singapore, GDG Singapore. Then another one was in the Philippines, I think Philippines and maybe Malaysia as well. So the channels was pointing to like multiple different places now because these communities also wanted their own version of those live stream like backed up in their own channels as well. Yeah, it's a more of a product statement like anyway. It's not really a technical challenge. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go into this second case study, which I think might be a bit more useful for most of you who have not used the cloud before. Uh, so this is what I call conference submissions with Google Cloud. Uh, quick question, anyone know who is Uncle Su? <gasps> Dr. Su Yun Jen. Oh, maybe he doesn't, he hasn't done a lot of modules here. Wait, really? Uncle Su? Oh, you all know him? I know him, but he doesn't, he doesn't teach like one. Oh, that is so sad. Okay, never mind. He was a, he was, he's one of the better profs I've seen in NUS. La. I mean, I've called him Uncle Su, so uh, I don't know how many profs you all call by uncle, but he usually he goes around and tells people, you all can call me Uncle Su, like a term of endearment, so to speak. Okay, anyway, long story short, uh, I did this small project for him uh, because he requested, like, you know, if I can help him look into uh, hosting this simple application for allowing folks in the school itself to submit their. Uh, papers via this tool. Okay, this never went live, but we just did it as like a very quick prototype. Okay, and I'm using this case study because I want to show you all how you all can also use the cloud, exploit it. Let's say if you're building your own projects or you're going to a hackathon, you want to host your, uh, some of your application somewhere. Okay, so the problem statement over here is very simple. We just needed like a cheap and easy to set up tool to run this conference submission. It's essentially a web application. Then what we have was actually this open source tool called Hot, RC, uh, Hot CRP. It's an open source application. Application code is already written there. You know, we don't have to do, we don't have to create this entire web application uh, from scratch. Okay. So the only challenge here is that we just need to make sure we know what to host it in. Like this application, as a web application, it needs to live somewhere in the cloud. And then we just need to make sure there's a database for saving all of the conference submissions as well. Okay, so very simply going back to the infrastructure diagram again, again, you have a web application as a black box. We know that this needs to be in the cloud environment somewhere. Okay, hosting solution. Uh, back to the same argument as mentioned earlier on. Anyone wants to make a guess which one we went for this time around? Oh, I should have brought some prizes. It would be easier to get. Sorry? Actually, serverless, serverless, yes, serverless. So we went with serverless lah. I mean, it's a simple web application. I'm not trying to uh, like solve for like some very customized needs. In fact, if I just use serverless, right? Let's say there's like, for some reason, there's 10,000 people trying to submit conference submissions at once. It should be able to scale up automatically by itself. I don't need to do any special things. Okay, so we went for this solution called Cloud Run. It's the, one of the latest serverless solutions in Google Cloud, okay? And then, as I mentioned earlier on, most serverless solutions, usually you use some form of uh, Docker images or containerization approach in deploying your applications there. So again, we have to find some place to host the images. Uh, this time around, as mentioned, you know, I'm going with Artifact Registry. Like I said, container registry is being deprecated. Please use this one if you are going for Google Cloud. Okay, um, and also SS control is also a problem. You know, just now we talked about uh, baking that key, right? That stream key, right, for the other case study. Now I need the password. I need to save this password to the database somewhere. So I can't store it in the Docker image. I should definitely store it 
uh, inside, uh, sorry, let me go ahead a little bit. I should store it inside Secrets Manager as well. And then same thing as well, because I need permissions to access Secret Manager, I also need to use IAM. Okay, and then for the database, lastly, the database, I'm using this thing called Cloud SQL. Uh, Cloud SQL itself, if uh, you guys are familiar with Postgres or MySQL, or even uh, the very ugly uh, Microsoft SQL Server, I don't know how many people use that, you can definitely use Cloud SQL for uh, serving your needs over there as well. Okay, and with that, by just setting up this very simple setup, right, we already have a web application running. And the more unbelievable thing is, it actually only took three hours out of the 12 hours I spent to set up this application. Like three hours just to configure this. Like, okay, I'm not doing any of the complicated CI/CD pipelines. I'm not doing, uh, like just now I mentioned, like the Terraform or Cloud uh, Deployment Manager, like infrastructure as code. Just setting up everything, three hours. It was really fast. Uh, and if you're building something like that for like your own projects, right? Setting up a web application on the cloud. It's that simple as well. As long as you know what tools you need to go for. It's usually quite simple to get this entire production grade application online. Uh, the rest is just more of me like doing like random uh, other tasks like in setting this this thing up. And you can see it's just a small portion of uh, setting up this entire project for the cloud. Okay, and the cost itself, uh, just to share for a little bit of transparency. Uh, actually, this one we spend more on this than the other live streaming project uh, because of the database. So database is going to be one of the more expensive stuff that you use in the cloud. Generally speaking, uh, at least from what I see, um, data also sharing the uh, the next portion of the sharing later on. Uh, and in the case of Cloud Run, because the amount of users uh, on our application, like in our case, right, it was just one, maybe like five people testing on this one single day. So you can see it's just five cents for running this web application online somewhere. Okay, so Essentially, again, going back to this entire uh, image for how you can run it in Google Cloud. But if you are a fan of AWS, this is how you look like in AWS. Uh, so don't, don't say I'm here to sell for Google Cloud because I'm really not, I don't get any money for this. Uh, but if you're using the same uh, relevant tools for uh, AWS, right? Serverless, you should go for Fargate uh, and then Image Registry for storing the Docker images. Uh, Secret Manager is actually named the same thing in Google Cloud AWS, except that it's Secrets Manager, not Secret Manager. Uh, database is just for RDS in uh, AWS lab. Again, it's mostly the same thing, can run Postgres, can run MySQL. Okay, so again, back to the learning lessons, uh, not just complex solutions, but even simple solutions being able to build fast with the cloud. And like I said, like you can do it really fast as long as you know what you need. Like the most important part usually is the problem statement, like solving for that first. Okay, last part before we go to the demo. Yeah, so, I like to just highlight over here. I know I show the case studies in Google Cloud, but then for the dangerous stuff, I put it up here. So, but it's, it's really not on purpose. If anything, right, is to show that actually, maybe in some sense, like, you know, work environments mostly, like, there's more people using AWS. Like. I mean, you can search the trends online. There's definitely more people using AWS than Google Cloud and Azure nowadays. Uh, so this was an actual situation that I faced at work a few years ago. Uh, how we managed to save like 50% of our cloud computing bill, right? I think across a time period of maybe half a year. So this is also to highlight to you, right? Uh, while the cloud is useful, it doesn't mean that you can just use it as it is. Like, you know, don't, don't, don't put any care into your systems. Okay? So as mentioned over here, cloud is good, it's useful, but you can't just find and forget it. If you do something like that, uh, you're going to get a root shock, maybe like one to two months from now, where you get your credit card bill, and then they will say $10,000 in there. Uh, and then you have to pay for it, unfortunately. Okay, so just to give a few examples of what happened, this is one thing I found in our live setup. In production, it happened in real life. Over-provisioned by 50 times. Uh, it, it's more of a human error, to be honest. And I went up to the DevOps engineer, I asked the person, hey, why is this over-provisioned by 50 times? Like, this is ridiculous. Uh, and the answer I got was, we're preparing for more people to onboard our platform. platform. But we've, we've been preparing, preparing for that for the last three months. months. So, so I told them, okay, don't need to go by 50 times. times. Just go by two times or maybe one and a half times. times. That's sufficient. Okay. So, so we brought down this entire settings. settings. Just one configuration change, right? 25%, almost 25% down. Okay. And, and that's to show you, right, how, like, if you don't take care in terms of setting up the configurations of your cloud services properly, right? Just one wrong configuration, right, can bring up your cost by a lot, which can be a problem for you. So in the, in the case, case of, of let's say, say like a 100,000 a month bill, right? 
I mean, this is already like 20 to 30,000. That's way more than my salary at this point as well. Then also a bunch of other optimizations we did along the way, uh, looking at removing transit gateways, uh, using like proper Kubernetes setup, uh, reducing our Redis cache instance as well, like you know the Elastic cache in AWS. All of these small little optimizations here and there, right? Okay, I'll share this slide later on if you want to read more into it because I don't want to jump into each of these um, technologies over here. But essentially, by just doing the entire pruning for half a year, right, we managed to find like drop our entire cost by fifty percent. And still getting the same performance from our applications, from our users using our applications. So this is just more of a stuck reminder, like don't fire and forget your cloud services. If you do that, it's more likely that you over uh, spend like you no know, uh, in time, uh, essentially. Okay, so and you all want to take photo, you can take photo about this. This one is just me telling you, uh, whether you're using Google Cloud or you're using AWS, right? There's always the free tiers. When I say free here, is I'm really not trying to cheat you or fake like this thing to you. There's a trial as well. Like usually they give you a few hundred dollars in trial credits, but there's also a free tier. Okay, and if I were to be completely honest with you, I abused this free tier when I was an NUS student ten years ago. Oh shit, it's really long. But ten years ago, there's this thing called App Engine that allows you to run I think twenty seven or twenty eight hours for free using the smallest instance, and I use that to run my own personal website for free lah. Since every day there's only twenty four hours. So you can definitely check out the free tier. If you can find like certain tools that you can use, just make sure you don't go past that, that, that free tier. La. I mean, if you pass it, then of course you pay money. La. Uh, but you should use it to experiment and build things that you, know, you want to you know, explore on, or maybe you're building something for Hackathon, for example. Okay, the demo. So let's see if we can do the demo today. Uh, okay, this is gonna be a little bit tricky, but okay, let, let's... let's uh, I'm gonna need everyone's help in doing this demo. Oh, go for it. That's why you said email, right? Email sending. Email sending, yeah. What do you use for the email as well? Well, I kind of forget it really. Uh, I kind of forget it really. Uh, yeah, this one I might have to get back to you later. I'm gonna say it's probably SES in AWS. Uh, okay, maybe just to share about that a little bit. Uh, for email services, right? Okay, you can definitely use things like SendGrid, uh, which helps you to um, set up a lot of the configurations without having to worry about like the nitty gritty details. Um, but we use something like SES, right, for applications because it's dirt cheap. Uh, so if you're looking at a very uh, cheap provider for sending emails, right, Amazon, uh, AWS, uh, SES is a, I think it's called SES, yeah, SES is a good solution that is very cheap, but you need to put in a bit of work to customize it. Okay, so I'm going to do this live stream using uh, StreamYard. It's not yet live, so I need to click this thing to go live. Uh, but essentially, okay, can I pluck out this thing? Is it if is anything going to go wrong if I pluck out this HDMI? <laughs> oh. oh, okay, it's okay. I okay. Can can I just then turn on my uh, turn off my volume so it doesn't go out in the speakers over here? Because I don't want to create that mirror effect. Wait, do I need to turn off from here? Audio. Okay. Okay. While while they're setting that, I need all of your help. Later on, right, we're gonna do this fun live stream demo thing. But we'll make the video a bit fun. When I turn the camera to y'all later, I just need y'all to cheer as much as you can for I don't know, like five seconds. Can I get all of your help to do that? We we'll do a we we'll do a rehearsal later on, but can can. Okay. Just uh, turn off the volume on your computer and that should be fine, right? Uh, because you shouldn't go I mean, okay, like then. As long as, as my computer is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, okay. Okay. We're, We're gonna, gonna do a rehearsal first. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm gonna, gonna pretend, pretend, pretend this is my computer. computer. And when, when I point it at you, just cheer as, as much as you can. Okay. Okay. Yeah. One, two, three. Yay! Yeah. Hey, come on, we're NUS students. I saw NUS before. More than that, come on. Let's try one more time. One, two, three. Yay! Yay. <laughs> we're all engineers, like <laughs> this, like. Okay, so remember that spirit. Uh, we're gonna kick to that level of spirit later on. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is a somewhat complex process. Okay, I need to. Okay, I hope I don't. I'm gonna move some of these things up, I'm not gonna drop it. Okay. 
I need to make sure I can just turn this around and find a DB. Okay, okay, can, can, can. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a signal, signal when, it, when it's good to go. Okay, for people who do public speaking or haven't, or you have done public speaking before, right? Usually there's this thing we like to call the demo god, um, and sometimes you have to pray to a demo god in case it works. Oh, it works! Okay, so it's the stream hasn't started yet. It's not live on the internet. Uh, okay, but I think we should be able to go for this as well. Ah, okay. Facebook works as well. So it's neat, lah. Okay, one, okay, I'm gonna point to you. One, two, three. <laughs> okay. Let, let, let's see if it. Okay, I think we can end the stream already. So it feels a little bit, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, like a bit of a letdown, but I'll, I'll share with you all the links in a bit if you all want to go and watch it. Okay, okay so as promised, okay, if you all want to go and see it, I put up this. Some of you might have already seen the title, so that was a bit of an inside joke. Uh, you can, you can check this out if you want, if you want to just get these links and um, see the live stream. But essentially, it's the process of going from StreamYard and then just pushing it out via... Uh, what happened was it went to Google Cloud and then after that towards uh, my YouTube channel as well as uh, the uh, Facebook page as well. Okay, I'm going to move already. Uh. No one no wants to scan anymore already. Uh. Your one, can, I can share again later on. Okay, 3, 2, 1. Okay, okay, advertisement time. I am from Ascenda and um, we are always looking for people. Hey, why you laugh? It's not funny, come on. This is a very serious slide. We are always looking for good engineers around. Uh, actually, I would like to share it's... Oh, stop laughing, you are making me laugh as well. But serious, uh, our culture in the company itself, I would say, is one of the better ones I've seen in uh, Singapore so far. So, if you are interested, um, I mean, internship for this moment is closed, but I think in the next half a year, probably we'll open it up again. Or if you're graduating soon, you're looking for a job, do hit us up. You know, we're always looking for great people to work with. And with that, that's the end. I'll share these slides later on if you want to see the stuff inside. I guess this is questions time. And if not, I'm going to block this out and run away now. Mm. Okay, in my case of the, what's that, this uh, live streaming application, right, we are only bringing it up during the time periods where we are running the event. So, I mean, it's just basically telling the team, right, please don't deploy when the events are going on. Um, in terms of the other application, right, if you're using Run, actually it's just a very simple uh, blue green deployment concept. Oh, no, sorry, rolling deployment. So essentially what happens is for web applications like the conference submission tool, right, you have the older application, maybe let's say you have five instances of that running. When you bring up that new application, they'll just bring up one instance first, and then when they see, okay, not a lot of errors happening in this application, I'll bring up a second instance, and I'll bring down one from the, the older application. They'll just keep doing it until they finish deploying the whole thing. That's why we call it rolling deployment. You can do that. Then, then my question, question is, when do you save that short screen? Okay, technically speaking, can. Uh, but then the question is, now you have to worry about access control to your local image. So, so if you put it like this, 
uh, let's say in the entire company, right, I have interns, I have fast, I have mid-level employees, I have like uh, the staff engineers as well. So usually we'll give production secrets access to only the high level staff because if you don't want anyone to just go in and wreck your systems. Um, but if you bake it inside a Docker image, what you're saying is that even for let's say the junior engineers who need the Docker image to run it locally or run it the development staging environment, they have access to the secrets as well. It's, it's not wrong, wrong it's just more, again, access, access control uh, issue. You can, can uh, nothing, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's up to you in the end. Like, well, I'll, I'll say the setting up the VPCs itself will be a bit more troublesome. If, if I go to IAM, it's just press a drop down, assign, yes, done. But like, is it like anyone can keep your card? Anyone can keep You're talking about the web application, right? Yes, if you allow people to, like it's a public application, you can allow people to do that, or you can put it behind authenticated, authenticated access as well. So you are easy to do with the IAM or the IAM? It's public. Because for Shreya, I don't really have access to the other systems. I can't just say, I don't really know what IP address they're coming from, so no choice at all. That's why I rely a lot more on that secret key instead. Yeah.